thank you for joining us. Uh, we are here to talk about ethical algorithms and how improving your AI diversity, equity, and inclusion can protect your business. Um, before I introduce our guests, I want to ask everybody a favor. We have a disclaimer here, since many of us here are uh, in the same industry and competitors and whatnot, there's legal disclaimer that says what we are and are not allowed to talk about. So if everybody could just take a minute and read that and then we will continue on. Good, everybody. Perfect. I made a deal with her. I was not going to read that thing. I was like, we'll just put it up, let everybody read it. I'm not reading that thing. Um, so let me introduce our guests here. Um, first, we have Dr. Katie Shilton. She is the Associate Professor uh, in College of Information Studies at University of Maryland College Park. Uh, your area research focus on technology and data ethics. And then we have Tony Sun, my other guest here. Um, Tony led the development of the world's first airline revenue protection solution entirely driven by data analytics and AI. Um, and I wanna just say one quick thing. When I was asked to do this, I started trying to kind of think about well, what does this mean? How does this practically apply as a technologist? Obviously, I'm interested in making sure that whatever we build is uh, you know, built correctly and so forth. But I was very, it was interesting, it came up twice yesterday. We had a panel yesterday morning where there was a, there was a quick conversation about uh, you know, something being presented uh, in a shopping scenario based on whether a user was you know, logging in from a Mac or a PC or something like that. And then, uh, Michael, I think there was, a, there was a session yesterday afternoon where there was discussions about AI and how it might apply uh, machine learning and how it might apply to airline pricing going forward. And uh, you guys made a comment about the algorithms, the AI algorithms, being a glass box and not a black box for transparency purposes. So I, I'm glad to, that those came up and those kinds of conversations came up. But um, first, I wanted to start with uh, Dr. Shilton. Can you just uh, maybe lay out some of the terminology for us? What, uh, how did diversity and inclusion differ? What is biases in data? And just kind of start us off with a little bit of terminology in case some of us are not quite as familiar with that. Yeah, Thank sure, you so sure, much. sure. Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things and talking to students about these things. Um, so let's start with with DEI, right? Mm -hmm. This acronym, um, and then we'll connect it to to data and bias. So, um, so diversity generally, so diversity, equity, inclusion are the sort of three concepts we're working here with here. Um, diversity is about different backgrounds, viewpoints experiences brought together in a team, uh, in a classroom, in, in a setting, right? And with the goal of getting different worldviews into conversation with each other. And we'll talk in a minute about why actually that's really important in building fair algorithms. Um, diversity can be quite important. Equity, that middle term, um, is about fair treatment. Um, and specifically fair treatment um, that supports success for everyone, or success no matter sort of who you are. So back to that diversity, success for you know, different uh, viewpoints, different backgrounds, different um, uh, life experiences. And so that doesn't necessarily mean treating everybody the same. In fact, it doesn't mean treating everybody the same. Equity is about removing barriers mm -hmm. so that everybody has the same chances. Um, and in a society where there are barriers for some people and not for others, uh, that, that that doesn't mean, you know, like my kids, I have two young kids, and they think fairness is everything the same. But it, even with your kids, it's not that's not it, right? They need different things. They, some of them need clothes this year, and some of them don't. <laughs> and so uh, removing of barriers is the way I like to think about it. And then inclusion is uh, proactive efforts, whether individually or on a policy level, to make sure that um, everyone feels welcome at the table, um, or feels welcome in an industry, or feels welcome in a workplace, um, or for me, you know, for us, in a university, in a classroom. Um, and so making an environment that works for everyone so that they don't get excluded from the get-go. And as I say, you know, that really can, it can be an interpersonal thing, but when we're thinking about it at work, we're often thinking policy level, right? Like, how do we have inclusive policies? So then we have this concept of algorithmic bias, right? Which you maybe read about, or um, and it's it's not the same as DEI, but it's very connected. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about algorithmic bias, we're not necessarily talking about statistical bias, although of course statistical bias is, is important when you're working with big data and you know looking. But what we're thinking about is 
procedural or process biases um, and systematic biases that might be part of an algorithm because of the data that was used. Um, so stuff, biases, social biases that are built into data sets because of how they were collected, because of who's in those sets or who's not in those sets. Um, it can be because of um, the way that indicators were framed. You know, when we're working with data, we're, we're, we're working with our best indicators for a phenomenon, right? Like it's, it can be really, it's, it's almost impossible to measure happiness. Instead, we have to measure all of these other things that we think get us to happiness, right? Those are indicators. And those indicators can have biases uh, built into them. So we're looking for kinds of bias um, built you know, for in, within data sets. There might be prejudices within a, a data set. Or, and this gets into machine learning, um, there might have been uh, a, uh, biases among data labelers. So whoever was sort of working with that data to label the data, maybe uh, it was done uh, in academia, it's always done with Amazon Turkers, um, and so you know, people are paid to sort of apply labels to data. Those, those people might have cognitive biases, um, and those can then get baked into data sets. So we're looking for systemic biases of various kinds that may work their way in to data sets um, at lots of different points in the, in the life cycle. Okay. Now, having defined that, let me ask you the why. Yeah. Why is this important? What are the consequences? Why does it matter if we don't intentionally build ethical algorithms? What do we stand to lose, and, and specifically within the airline industry? Yeah. We... Um, so I'll give you both the carrot and the stick, sure. right? <laughs> and so uh, the stick is the winding up on the New, in the New York Times yeah. um, because you built the thing that nobody expected, and turns out it had bias built into it, and it was unfair to a group of people, and now you're national news, right? And this happens in various industries. Um, I mean, you've mentioned some. Uh, yep. Sometimes it's happened in this industry. Uh, so that's you know that's like the first reason is like okay, let's be careful about this because we don't that you don't want your family to be the one who's like like you built that, right? But. Um, that's the, that's the stick. Let's, let's talk about the carrot, right? Mm -hmm. And that is like, if we think of travel as an industry that is about accessibility in many ways, right? Accessibility to the world mm -hmm. for everyone. And travel is not just a luxury for the rich, if, if it ever was. Um, we live in a global society. People need to go be able to see their families, right? They need to be able to travel the world. We should not have a system in which travel is unfairly inaccessible to certain groups um, if we can prevent that now, you know, this entire talk will be in tension with profits, with with capitalism at its its roughest, right? Um, uh, because discrimin price discrimination, for instance, is one definition of yep. discrimination, yep. Um, and not necessarily always a bad one, right? It's not, it, it is a useful tool. But when does price discrimination become discrimination? Discrimination, right? right. And that is the hard line that AI uh, builders are thinking about and walking. So you know, we're we're trying to balance an accessible industry. Uh, with other goals that are and values that our companies have, um, so that's you know I think where we put it is like let's try our best because we we want a fair industry ultimately. Okay. I like that thought about the price discrimination. I'm going to come back to that one in a little bit. I'm noting that one for later questions. So Tony, in a B2B environment, yeah. uh, I know you guys are a little bit further removed from the the direct and the customer, but what Correct. does uh, diversity, equity, inclusion mean to you guys in uh, what you do? Um, sure. Um, perhaps just to start with, um, I, I, I'm sure many of us suffer a bit of a jet lag. If you find that whatever I speak is not, not making sense, question your, <laughs> question your own jet lag first before you question mine, yeah. right? Um, Michael said he's going to question us on everything, so I think we've already, <laughs> we've already got somebody ready to, ready to do that, yeah. yeah. Um, so just uh, before I answer that question, just to give everybody a very brief intro about what this industry uh, or the particular function I'm, I'm in, right, or the ratio is in. Um, we're pretty much helping airlines to protect their revenue, detect, uh, detect any revenue leakages through data analytics and, and so on, right? In the past, this industry is heavily as a business processing, outsourcing type of uh, uh, function. So there will be a lot of people in India actually after graduation, they actually start work, uh, go, going through the IATA training, start using the screen to, to look up on the, um, uh, on the screen to look for the face and so on. And then subsequently, they will decide whether there is a violation or not, whether there is a revenue leakage. 
right? For them, of course, they also talk about AI as well, mm -hmm. right? So they actually do do a little bit of automation using Amadeus uh, uh, pricing engine, and then they also try to intelligently uh, doing a bit of a matching, and then they call it AI. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so with Rashio, when we come to this uh, part of the solving this problem, um, instead of uh, if we take a very traditional approach, right, which is you got this uh, all the analysts to actually produce the results, right. So now you have the perfect data set, right. You have the data sets showing this is no violation. This data set actually is contains violation. Machine go and learn about, learn, learn about it. And run and then try to do the same thing uh, after that. Then obviously that will suffer quite a bit of a bias that built into built into that. So those are all the analysts. Obviously they will focus on certain agents because they found that agents tend to uh, detect violations in the past or they go to a certain country. So those biases will, will uh, creep in, right? If you take a very traditional AI approach on. A machine learning approach to that. Um, instead, when we come to this uh, part of the problem, what we did was uh, using data analytics as the way to um, to come to solve this problem, mm -hmm. right? So what we pretty much do is using the ATP code data, right? The, the pricing data, all the rules and so on, applied to millions of transactions, uh, booking data, ticketing data, try to have remove as much of a bias as possible. Right. So as a result, um, unless the uh, the airline rules contains biases and so on, and the way how it's coded into the systems contain that, otherwise we don't quite suffer as much of a bias as uh, typically B two C kind of uh, scenarios. Right. But then your question was, uh, given you we don't suffer that kind of biases, then what does this uh, uh, DEI actually mean mean to us? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, certainly, when we come to um, come to this uh, uh, as a building a company, it, it is a startup. Uh, we actually do pay a lot of attention. We do uh, certainly conscious about these carrots and sticks and and so on. Uh, for us, obviously, the long term benefit is the the diversification will help us to um, take a more balanced approach when we think about the problems we. Uh, get us opinions from many different angles. Um, so one of the things when typically when we employ people after the, the offer is made, I typically, typically get them to do uh, a, a Myers-Briggs um, mm -hmm. typology or the, uh, the personality test. So that makes sure people join the team is well balanced, right? Um, but certainly as a, a, as a company, we invest heavily to try to diversify uh, in terms of how we recruit people. Um, perhaps it's just a, it's a, uh, a bit of a different country to what typically American, uh, perhaps, I, I don't know about American uh, labor market, but in Australia, if you put a job ads out, say, I want a data engineer, right? You, you bet that 60% of the applicant will have the Indian background, mm -hmm. right? The other 30% will have the Chinese background. And then the rest of the world to make up that ten percent, right? That that end up giving us a very little choice as a diversification. But nevertheless, as a as a company, uh, we try to employ uh, people from many many. Right now, it's up to ten nationalities as a as a background. So rather than just having kind of a modern uh, culture side of it. Right, and then also in terms of the the, um, the male female side, we also try to ensure that we get about 30, 40 percent of the the female being the data analyst, data engineers, rather than just a typically men um, participating in, in this. Okay. Right. Um, quick question for you as a follow-on. I'm anecdotally assuming, but I'm hoping you can confirm this, that having a diverse group of people at your organization whose job it is to look after these algorithms, build them, and so forth, will help you in recognizing yes. a, a <clears throat> bias or a, an unfairness or inequity in the this situation. Is yeah, it's it's along. Yeah, it's one of the more more important tools you can have because. We all bring our standpoints to these socio-technical problems, right? So we, we call these socio-technical problems because they are not just technical and they're not just social. It's the two interwoven, right? That makes them tricky because you need somebody who has a background to say, oh, you know what? 
in the United States, there have been historic forms of discrimination that might show up in this data set. That is a tough thing for somebody trained up as an engineer to know, right? Um, and that's fair to have that, that blind spot. But if you have somebody on the team who has a different educational background, right, who has a different cultural background, they may be more likely to spot those issues. And that issue spotting is one of the hardest parts of, of trying to, to, to find systemic bias. Um, so yeah, so we, we're, what we are seeing is diversity on teams is uh, really helpful in issue right. spotting. So we're good, you got that one covered. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, That's all right. right, next one for you, Tony. Let's yeah. talk about the great things about algorithms and AI and flight shopping and how they can help consumers and airlines alike going forward. Hmm. Uh, I think this topic probably came up during the uh, yesterday, uh, especially uh, yesterday afternoon uh, afternoon's discussion. Um, perhaps I talk about this using uh, approach it from a slightly different mm -hmm. angle. Right. So uh, I'm sure if you look at it today, and then even we look at the statistics this morning, starting from like a 2017, we got about 2 billion fares, and then 2018 got a 3 billion, and then eventually now got about 8 billion or 7 billion fares um, published uh, every year. Right. So it's a, it, it is a huge amount of data. Then comes to the, uh, the dynamic pricing, the, the, uh, the dynamic, sorry, the one order and that kind of a concept that potentially will get these uh, possibilities completely uh, exploded to the point where traditional approach of looking up the fares and then you do the audit and detect any possibilities of violations is totally impossible. Right. So, I think the algorithm and the approach we have as a using a, a data analytics approach will make this possible for airline to engage into this uh, dynamic pricing. So now you instead of an airline, you have a two million fares. You manage you actually have a twenty million passengers, right? All of a sudden now, uh, I think on day one, atypical outlaid that this uh, kind of like once you offered, made a dynamic offer, actually you backfile yep. those fares and rules, right? Now, all of a sudden, 20 million passengers, you will have 20 million prices. And uh, then you, how do you actually ensure that revenue <coughs> leakage is not going to happen? So this uh, an data analytics is the key approach we take to ensure that uh, this uh, new way of doing things is well supported, not just at the early uh, upstream type of work using various APIs and so on, but also supported by downstream um, players like us to to ensure that the action is taken. Okay. Um, and I know, Dr. Shilton, I know your experience with the airline industry specifically is more limited, but just in general, how you have seen in the past AI and algorithms and machine learning and so forth, improve a, a process, a, a capability, whatnot. Do you have any thoughts on how that might apply to our industry on the positive uh, side? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I see, I think, lots of room for this kind of learning in terms of, um, I mean, we talked about accessibility before, right? Mm -hmm. You know, targeting uh, folks with opportunities for travel that they can that you know that work for them in yep. whatever way that is right um, and making sure that they know about it when that opportunity is available um, to me I mean the personalization that can come with this kind of technology is is not always bad and creepy right like it really it really does make uh, more opportunities available to the right consumers at the right time if if used well okay. so I think that that's pretty exciting okay. and I think that's kind of our next question actually we were rolling right into that one before, go ahead uh, sure before you do that of course. actually I would um, suffer the jet like uh, definitely forget no half of the page <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, the the question is, uh, uh, we we use data analytics right to to help airlines to do the detect any potential revenue leakages, even on some of these uh, potential biases could be introduced because you uh, obviously when we um, try to help airlines, uh, we try to find a way to say when this rule is applied whether there, you can detect the leakage or de depend on how you interpret the rules, right? Despite the many uh, long, many sections of the menus and the interpretations. So as a company, we actually regularly have written 
uh, emails to to ADP Co actually to seek clarifications, mm -hmm. right? Instead of a, we take our angle of the interpretation and say this is a violation because this is how I read or how we read about this category four. Sorry, I got into the jargons um, and, and so on, which is about the flight restrictions. Uh, we actually do write to ATP Co say in such a scenario, right? What would be the common uh, understanding? Right, so regularly, sometimes even ATP call wrote to us and say, "Let me consult to uh, this particular working group. They will actually provide you actually more unbiased interpretation, and then subsequently you can implement that." So that's uh, when we come to this part, we actually do do everything, okay. try to remove biases. Well, we tend to want to help airlines to recover more revenue. Okay. So now I know you have your list there, and we have the questions that we we're going to talk about. Dr. Shilton kind of stole my lead there. She led us right into the next question, which is what opportunities or do we see potential algorithms to actually bring increased diversity and inclusion to airfare shopping and so forth? And I think you just touched on that, but let's get your side on that one. Uh, since you can see, you might as well yeah. just read it. Well, I took, my, <laughs> I took my glasses off, so now I can see out to here, but nothing beyond. So that's it. <laughs> I can't see any <laughs> facial expressions. You guys can laugh at me all you want. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> um, so obviously what we do is, uh, um, I, I think this question probably can interpret in two ways. One is how you ensure um, w whatever the things of ensure is fair and so on, um, is actually built into the solutioning, mm -hmm. right? Another one is probably the angle I'm coming back is uh, uh, whatever we do, um, is interpreted how to ensure the result uh, of this is actually unbiased and fair and, and so on, right? Um, and, and then also encourage the industry to, to grow and, and diversify and or whatever. Um, I think with the revenue uh, protection, right, quite often in the past, uh, if it is not detec detected, then in general, there's a more manipulative agent will have an advantage over more kind of like a follow the rules type of agents, right? If we don't do that over a longer time, you will find the manipulative approach will be gradually uh, dominate the things, right? So uh, for us, if we take a, a very thorough approach, ensuring the, uh, the, the overall industry is very healthy, very fair, and everybody compete on the same ground, uh, on a level ground, um, this is a, probably our contribution mm. To the society, uh, not society, but industries of fairness and uh, and the long term growth. Um, question for you: How do you prepare people to deal with this? So, if you're talking, for example, about engineers, you mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. sometimes something will come more naturally to an engineer, sometimes it won't, right? Mm -hmm. With regard to this kind of thing. So, are we saying here anybody who's going to be working with these data sets or with these algorithms or writing the code? Do they need some sort of ethical training or is it just not something that you can teach in a classroom that's simple, more complicated than that? Great question. So we absolutely think we can teach it in classrooms. Universities are trying hard. We're, we're still working on it. So ethics um, is actually notoriously difficult to teach. And so there, there are all of these studies like in business school programs and law school programs, which have mandatory ethics courses. Um, those ethics courses can have bad results. Like people learn how to cheat and, and things like that. So we don't want to do that. Um, so in the data ethics space, we're really, we're, we're still, um, how can I say fl flying the plane while we, yeah, while sure. we buy it in this, really? in this crowd? We do it all uh, the time. We build it, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> we're rebuild the planes while we're flying them all the time. <laughs> so, you know, we're still trying to figure out what works in terms of data science, ethical data science education and ethical AI education. Um, but some things that we are trying that uh, seem promising are multidisciplinary education. So mm -hmm. like at Maryland, we have a new uh, social data science program that combines deep um, you know, expertise in uh, uh, data analytics and data visualization with uh, uh, classes in the social sciences. So in African-American studies, in sociology, in political science, so that students get theory and method from a discipline, right? From a sort of traditional uh, social science discipline so that they can sort of spot A, this is the wrong data for this problem, or B, this data might have these biases you know, built in because I learned about this, right? Or, or C, um, this analysis might be a problem, right? All of these things can happen. So that's one thing we're trying. Um, in the AI space, we are similarly trying uh, to sort of build 
new design practices into, so it's, you know, there's a long tradition in, for instance, human computer action, human computer interaction of building user interfaces with community input, right? With, uh, with user input, there's UI, UX, right? And like, uh, we don't have that equivalent yet in AI. What does like user interaction look like for training a, a model, mm -hmm. right? That, that's like not, it's a whole different set of techniques. So we're, we're working in the research space on trying to figure out what does community input to an AI technique look like, right? Um, for an AI developer, like when do you go to stakeholders and test this with them, right? Um, so we're still figuring we are we're still figuring this out. I don't have like concrete. Here's what you should do. Answers. That said, there is some because the best practices aren't known yet. There's some room to for you all, I think, to sort of start to figure them out. Um, you know, we know that diversity on teams will help. Um, we know that building transparency to what, and so we've, we've talked a little bit about this, the glass box, not the black box, right? Transparency to the point that you can with your systems is going to help because it's going to allow you, if somebody spots a problem, to go back and try and figure out why it's happening and like why that decision ended up biased. Um, uh, there are some suggested practices around transparency that, that might work well. Um, these are mites, but uh, for instance, the Algorithmic Justice League, which is a nonprofit working in this space, has suggested bug bounties for AI bias. Um, so bug bounties are something that happen in the computer security world where you ask people to find the problems in your system, outside people, and you pay them if they yeah. do. And this used to be super controversial in security and is now common practice because it works. Um, what if we did this for bias and algorithms, right? What if you had you could have a red team that was internal, that looked at your algorithms and tried to find the problem, right? Um, or you could, you know, pay uh, a kid in Australia to, to do it, right? You know, like, uh, or to just spot it and give them a reward if they do. So that might be one sort of work practice or process that we could start to look at. Um, and then, you know, I think anything we can do to sort of increase our ability, um, I say ours, te technical people, and I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not totally a technically technical person, but our ability to think socio-technically, sort of practice this um, because it, it can be really easy to just put your head in the data and go, right? Um, and to like practice this sort of reflective and reflexive, are there problems with my data? Like where do this, what, you know, who, 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 these features, like where do they come from, right? Um, and are they really indicative of what I'm trying to accomplish here? Um, and that kind of um, reflective process, I think, can help us step back and, and it's just so easy to get into the pipes and just do it. Um, so those are the, the, the best things we know so far. Okay. And Tony, what do you guys actually do in order to accomplish this, or to the extent that you can, uh, you know, help uh, train folks to be able to spot those situations and and uh, deal with them accordingly? Um, but for us, um, well, besides training and so on, uh, we probably outsource the problem to the industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if we do do the detections, right? The detections usually will have two type of mistakes, right? Typically talk, talk about type, type one, type two. So for us, we will have these false positives, right? So you detect something as a, as a violation. That could result as an ADM. So I'm, I know it's a jargon some people, probably most of us uh, do know. ADMs is sent to a travel agency. You will actually come to, uh, come to protest and say you, you do get things wrong. What happened to your algorithm? What happened to the, the, the uh, data training and, and so on? So we do jump in and try to figure out exactly where things are actually have gone wrong. And, and then we do, uh, I think the typical airlines will also try to keep us uh, working as hard as possible. So quite often after the machine, they have something else. They will, uh, as they call the second pass audit, mm -hmm. right? Which is a human. They bring up a couple of cases and say, what happened to your machines did not produce this, right? So we, again, we will get into that to understand what happens, try to ensure our results um, is balanced, accurate, and so on. Now suffer the bias onto one, one direction. Um, I think to ensure the results are not biased is one thing, but uh, quite often it's uh, more important for me was how we act on the results, right? The data uh, being detected. So, um, for example, when we help airlines to do audit, right? Let, let me assuming this is a re uh, related to commission climbing, right? So for every wrong climbing of commission by the travel agent, there is the other side, which is an agent actually forget to claim commission. Now the question is for us, we're no longer acting on that piece of information, 
right? And the, traditionally, the service provider would never produce that information, but our algorithm and the results actually do produce that flip side of the, the other side of the coin. So it will be actually so much more after this session, perhaps you should talk to airlines, say, look, you, you do have agents forget to claim commission. The reason you come up this in this market, you come up this uh, commission structure is to encourage sales and, uh, and people come to you and so on. Now, if you don't act on this piece of information, perhaps it's uh, leading to a long-term lose-lose scenario where agents are not getting incentivized in selling your tickets. And then gradually at some point you keep the short term money, not paying out, but over long, much longer time, uh, you probably lose revenue from doing that. Okay. Right. So we, we do outsource our checking. Okay. <laughs> and what have you guys seen with organizations? Do they, how do they kind of provide some methodology for oversight of the people that are building these algorithms. Is it a maker checker type of situation? Nothing goes out the door unless somebody else looks at, you know, how do they do that? So the, the most formalized versions I've seen um, are coming out of uh, places like Microsoft Research, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, you know, so you, some of you may remember Microsoft released a language bot um, uh, that was trained on with natural language processing, was trained on the internet and quickly became racist um, because the internet taught it. Um, and, and so uh, Microsoft after that said, okay, we need, we need a, like an internal review process before we release these sort of products. And they've been um, really on top of sort of having a, uh, just sort of a, a check, and I, I don't know enough about exactly how it works internally, but they do have a sort of internal check um, the process. Um, Similarly, this isn't exactly in the same space, but in the data ethics space, Facebook um, famously established now Meta, uh, an internal review process for uses of data in the company after um, and there was a, a scandal about using data for research. There were uh, researchers, they were uh, uh, experimenting with people's timelines to see if it would uh, change people's, the, the emotional valence of people's posts. Uh, so they would give you your friend's gloomy posts and then see if you got gloomier, essentially. Um, and it had a very small effect size, but it was a big psychological study that was occurring on the platform in real time and users were pissed yeah, <laughs> about it. And after <laughs> that, <Anything. laughs> yeah, exactly. And after that, um, uh, Facebook and, and now Meta has an internal review process for um, data-oriented research projects that happen because they do a ton of research with their, mm -hmm. with their data to figure out you know, what they should be marketing to users and, and they do A-B testing and stuff, but all of that has to go through um, a review board now internally. So there's sort of a set of checks and it slows things down, but it also ho hopefully helps prevent these kinds of egg on face moments uh, to have, you know, somebody else who hasn't been directly involved in the project say, okay, so what did you do? What data did you use? What conclusions did you draw? Can you tell why the system is making these decisions? Um, and uh, sort of have that conversation internally. Back to the last box versus the black right. box. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, let's go back to Tony for a second. So you guys, you mentioned something earlier about the fact that you're in Australia and familiarity with, you know, US and so forth. Um, do you view kind of things being different geographically? Is it uh, the DEI mean something uh, you know more or less uh, harder, easier, whatever in one country versus another? Have you guys seen any evidence of that? Um, I, 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 no, actually, uh, um, because we work in this uh, airline industry, which is pretty much global, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in, in, in terms of the practice, um, we have not, um, as a small company, we certainly pay attention to, to this, but uh, just uh, have not invested sig significantly uh, in this. Um, but nevertheless, whenever we do things, we try to ensure that um, the data analysts, uh, engineers, and so on, not try to write too many if else's. Uh, based on their own judgment and so on. It, it is relying on the industry standards and uh, the, the data as much as possible. Let the, st uh, let the standards and the data to decide the scenarios and the outcome. So that's, uh, that's what we do. Okay. Um, and actually, I'm gonna come back to you on the same question. Uh, global diversity, cultural, so on and so forth. I suspect that plays a role. I'm from a Middle Eastern background. I, you saw me asking, uh, gentleman for whiskey seven times before we started to try and calm my nerves a little bit. So obviously this doesn't apply to me, but in certain Middle Eastern cultures, right? If you offered them a booze, you know, they may not like that because it's not part of their culture. So how does the cultural norms and so forth 
factor into this problem that we're talking about? You have asked the million dollar ethical question. Write that <laughs> and down. that is that. Write that down. So <laughs> data, data use norms <laughs> and uh, procedural expectations for system decision making systems are highly contextual. Uh, it depends on the country, it depends on the industry, it depends on how people are used to decisions being made in that space, how people are used to data being traded, treated in that space. But our AIs are increasingly globally, they're out of context, right? They're taking data from one context and applying it in another. They're taking data from one culture and applying it to another. We do not know exactly how to deal with this because our people's reactions and norms, as you say, will vary based on the, the market that you're working in. Um, and uh, ethicists, philosophers, don't really know how to solve this problem, right? Are there universal ethics? Yes, but they're very high level, right? Like, they're not low level enough to get, like, in the, I mean, as, 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 once we build, if we build AIs that are, you know, weaponized, for instance, we can get into universal ethics about those, right? Like, they probably shouldn't kill humans. That's a yeah. pretty universal law. There's a movie about that. Right, oh, yes, yeah. we were talking about that earlier, right? So, like, those are the easy cases. They say they're scary, they're, but they're the easy cases because we have some universal once we get into questions of discrimination, questions of um, uh, you know differences in uh, how a system decides, you know who gets one benefit or another, uh, we it is much harder to sort of come up with universal laws, um, and that's a challenge when you're building a system that's meant for everyone, um, yeah. and it's it's one that we have not satisfactorily figured out how to do. You know, should it change based on markets, or is that itself unfair? Right, yeah. um, if your system changes how it, its output. So you are not alone in asking this question. Everybody is kind of wondering um, as we move into these global systems how to handle this. And I'm afraid that I am not a smart enough person to have an answer. <laughs> but you know, as you all start to navigate this, tell me what you figure out. Yeah. I think for us, air travel is about as global as it gets. Right? It really is. It really is, right? Um, what time check? Uh, I think we're done in five minutes. Okay. So I came up with a couple of questions uh, beyond our list, and then I'll open it up to anybody who might have questions here. One of the questions was, um, it's, I'm gonna ask you guys to talk about it from two perspectives, but it's really the same question. From a skill set perspective, if a person is interested in getting into this field, or a company is interested in bringing somebody in who can be a member of the teams and effectively do some of these things that we're talking about, what are the skill sets? What are the credentials? What are the learnings? What are you looking for? So start with you on that one. So I'll tell you what we're thinking on the training side, um, and you know the uh, tradition or traditionally, there's not a lot of traditionally when it comes to the space. It's new, <laughs> but um, uh, if you are hiring right now in this space, you will get sort of a mix of people who are recent grads who maybe have data science in their degree or maybe have machine learning experience, um, you know, in a computer science department, um, and then a mix of people who have taught themselves to do it either in their jobs. Um, uh, you know, through they've been working for a while and they've learned to do it um, that way, or through code academies and things like that. Um, so it's a really diverse space of education right now. Um, you know, universities have sort of a vested interest in uh, making it a little. Uh, we want our students doing these jobs, right? So um, I, I won't say, and I, but I don't think, I don't think that universities need to be the only path for training in data science. I do think there are some advantages to you know, training our students in data science like we can do these interdisciplinary things very easily because we have all these folks on campus who have expertise in race and racism and have expertise in gender studies mm -hmm. and have expertise in areas that are going to help us, you know, have these conversations. Um, so universities are a good place to do this training and I would look for people who have not only data science and ML machine learning credentials but also you know, took some area studies courses, mm -hmm. or uh, took some courses in method and uh, and methodology or uh, social theory, uh, because they're going to have a little bit of those pieces of questions like, is this data quality data, right? Um, you know, would would some other kind of data get us to a better answer to this question, right? Or a better uh, train our systems and our models in better ways. Um, you know, what if we adjusted it for X or Y, right? So that kind of expertise, um, I think, is something to look for. I would hope that people would look for that. Um, you know, even for folks who uh, don't have 
uh, data science degrees, which mm. are so new. Um, but there are more and more of them out there, I will say. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in recent grads, there's lots of data science programs now. Every university is going hard. <laughs> How about people that are already in the field? So you've got somebody yeah. in the field that have been doing data and possibly even you know, working in AI and algorithms and so on and so forth, but they want to diversify their skills so that they can now say, hey, I can help my company with DEI as it pertains to artificial intelligence. What is what yeah. is a good path for somebody? Who's Let me talk to you about master's programs. No, I'm not going to sell you on our <laughs> master's degrees. <laughs> well, Although we do have job. those, right? Yeah. Oh, they're meant for working professionals. Oh, no. okay, great. <laughs> but, Thank you. Um, so, no, I, I think this is actually a really good question. I think that actually industry groups can have pretty meaningful. So, I don't know in the in your industry, are there continuing education? opportunities yes so i think that is the place for this this conversation right mm -hmm. is in the continuing education right because this is newly relevant these skills are just developing like i said in two years i'm gonna have a different answer for like the how we do this than i do now because we're still figuring it out um, and so continuing education i think is a really good way of addressing um you know how we build this as we're flying it that you know that we can we can continue to uh disseminate best practices as we figure them out through uh, industry orgs okay and does that ring true with you guys? What do you guys are typically looking for when you're looking for somebody to bring in to help you with your AI and your algorithms and so forth? Yeah, well, I, by, by the way, when you uh, talk about the question, initially I said that's another million dollar question. Oh, um, thank you, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I record it. <laughs> yeah. Tell somebody from um, <laughs> uh, Let me share two, two stories on this uh, recruiting and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then how we come to uh, some, uh, how we approach this, right? I remember when Rasho just started in 2016, right? And uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, they come to Rasho and say, look, we got a many, many millions of uh, people, members, and they all got this uh, IT background, got all these things, why don't you recruit them, right? So before then, I did actually contact IT people, do you have some people? They said, no, I, I remember Samuel Lau, I, I guess uh, some most people mm -hmm. probably don't know. He said, if I got people, I will keep it myself, why do I give it to you, right? <laughs> so LinkedIn come to us and say, look, do you want some people? We said, yes, we want the people in the data analytics field, and then AI, everything was come with it and so on. So they actually said, no problem, we we're gonna help you to find. So they came the word like uh, um, the um, the IT side, they said, oh, still got millions. Then I would talk about airline background, then you got uh, tens of thousands. Then finally we said the word ATP code. Then they found the three names, they're all in Washington, DC, <laughs> all right? <laughs> So that means the, that, that, that rule actually get killed. And then at some point we did get to the natural language processing because we do need to, um, one of the airlines we support, come, uh, they actually produce 40,000 uh, contracts, right? We do need a machine to read through the 40,000 contracts. And uh, the problem we struggled with that was um, the expectation of the candidates at that time was extremely hot. Uh, it was extremely, uh, to the point I would say, unrealistic, right? So they mm -hmm. come here two months later, there's another even more exciting job before they even know about the industry well enough, they already jump to the next one. And then the other one come and then and go around, we have about seven people uh, rotated in a matter of one and a half years. So we never really got to get to anywhere. So now, then after that, we decided just uh, uh, grow, uh, do the homegrown, uh, part. So in terms of people we recruit, uh, are they typically uh, come from, uh, we, we diversified into many uh, science fields, engineering fields, not necessarily having computer science, right? We just want people having very strong problem solving mm -hmm. uh, on the IQ side. The reason I said that there's another million dollar question is that typically the other half of the, uh, the interview discussion I was trying to assess the EQ side, mm. right? People actually do come to the problems, do come to the team working, and even including this ethical side mm. of things, actually taking a very mature approach to that. Um, of course, I haven't quite figured out the answer. We look forward to get some answers from everybody else. Um, but that's what we look for, people being good at the problem solving, but also have the maturity to take on the, uh, the, the problems we are dealing with. Okay. And then my last question is stemmed from something you said earlier. I said I'm going to come back to it, which is to some extent, we actually want to use AI and these data sets and these algorithms to, uh, from a commercial perspective, to actually 
figure out where there is a commercial opportunity. And in some cases, that bias is, I think, you know, Michael's willing to pay for this service and this service and this <laughs> service, and I'm going to put that offer in front of him because I think he's going to, he wants it, right? He's going to a meeting the next day, I think, whatever. So in some cases, that bias or that identification of that pattern is a commercial good thing. I'm going to put the product in front of him that he wants. He's going to pay for it. He'll be happy. I make some money. All is good. But at some point, you can cross the line. And now you have gone into some of those territories that you were describing earlier. What? I'm assuming there's no magic, you know, eight ball that you can go to and go, is this, where's the line and how do I cross it? But some ideas, some mm -hmm. observations that you guys have had about yeah. how to figure out where that line is? You no, know, I actually think you, there, there is a pretty good way to tell. And that is, is my price discrimination really about individuals mm -hmm. and their willingness to pay for that service? Or are there buckets of people who are going to be given higher prices or who are not going to be offered these services um, in a systematic way, right? So not buckets like, you know, it, it, you know, like if it, so, you know, the three of you got offered this deal and the three of you didn't, okay. Unless the three of you all or also were, um, you know, uh, had indicated on your last flight that you wanted a kosher meal, mm. right? Or uh, you all live in a zip code, um, which is predominantly African American. Got it. Or, you know, so there, then you start to say, okay, wait, was there another structural reason besides the person's preferences, besides their travel the next day? Um, a structural reason that they don't have anything to do with, right? That was not their fault that they didn't get that deal or that they did. They got that higher price. That's when you start to, to look. And so you want to look across for sort of systematic patterns. Um, no problem with, you know, charging me more because I have to go tomorrow. And, yeah, you know, and also, uh, yeah, okay. I would like to upgrade to because it's a, you know, overnight flight or whatever. Um, no problem. Uh, doing that to only giving those opportunities to people in my zip code would be a problem because of where I live. Right. So you're kind of looking for those patterns that are maybe not directly related to the business yeah. situation. But exactly. coming in. And that's kind of why I said, I mean, so much of the benefit here is about actual personalization, right? We can yeah, break out absolutely. of those social categories and go to preference based categories. Yeah. And like, that's that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You know, we've been talking yeah, about we don't want to days. sort on zip code forever, right? <laughs> that's a problem. So, yeah. yeah, it's just avoiding those systemic problems. OK, that's everything I had. How much time do we have? 15 minutes. Questions from you said you were going to ask a bunch. So you've been kind of quiet. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think it's definitely a rel very relevant problem. And I, I'm personally very interested in it because I, I actually am trying to develop an ethical framework myself um, on dealing with this type of biases. And, and very often, I think, you know, uh, I think everything you said so far is great. I mean, it's a, but I think there's need to be a next step, right? The thing is like, if you really trace down to the fundamental cause of these biases, it really comes down to human decision, right? We make decisions that are biased. A lot of people think that bias is a data problem. It is, okay? But who generated those data? We did, right? Yeah. So, so what can you do to make us be more aware of the fact that we are making biased decisions, right? And, and actually solve the problem at the root cause. Right? I think there's a lot of opportunity there. To, so I think what uh, Tony was talking about, like using data analytic, those data analytics reports can be fed back to the analysts to let them see you know, what they did. Right? I mean, then they could say, oh, maybe I, I've been acting biased. I didn't know I was acting biased, but I was actually you know, uh, capturing a lot more, you know, flagging something that I, you know, a lot more than for a certain region or certain, certain type of transaction versus other, right? Maybe they didn't know that, but if having the analytic fund to see it, they would be much more aware of that, right? And likewise, you know, in um, say in HR, in hiring, right? I mean, uh, if, you've been, if you've been shown that you've been hire, hiring, the last five guy you've been hiring are all like white male or, or something like, you know, 35 to 45, then you would think that maybe I should, you know, next guy I should hire is maybe, you know, out of that, that you know, that bucket, right? So. 
So that's the kind of thing that I, I like to think a little bit further. Right? That's why I, I uh, very often like to challenge. You know, I think having all this process, having diversity is, is, is a great thing. Uh, but ultimately, uh, if you really want to solve the problem at the root cause, we should try to kind of you know, use this type of feedback mechanism to change behavior. <laughs> you know, that includes decision of the humans. How we, you know, come up with those, you know, like I said, a lot of these are cultural, right? We may not be aware of it, and, but with data analytics that feed back to us, we may become a, um, easily recognizable, so. Yeah, a, a root problem here is that, <clears throat> that data science and AI, they just reify problems that were already there that were already in the data structural problems. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so Amazon actually found this out with their hire, they built a hiring algorithm, they trained it on their successful engineer yep. um, resumes and then they only hired white men <laughs> because That's that right. was who they had hired before. <laughs> and so that, so in some, in some ways, I actually think these systems give us exactly as you're saying, a lens in to something we were already doing. Yeah. Right? Our own um, bias. Yeah. yeah, and our own biases. And then the question becomes, well, how do we fix those? So sometimes I worry I'm working on the wrong problem by trying to fix AI when you know what we need is like a fix human. safety net that doesn't, <laughs> you know, yeah, like a, you know, protects people's data and all. Yeah. So yeah, I, it, this is a this is a really good problem uh, point. Um, that said, I do think there's you know a real advantage to knowing that tech tends to reify existing problems and to be on the lookout for that um, as a window into those problems. So put the eye out in front and make sure that your organizations are dealing with that as a general theme and then also be on the lookout for how it may apply to algorithms and machine learning and AI and so on and yeah. so forth. But DEI itself as a human concept needs to be the one that's at the front, at the forefront. I think so. Yeah. I hope so. Anybody else? <laughs> Oh, John's back there. He saw my million yeah, dollar question. <laughs> wow. I didn't even Dude, I took my glasses off. I didn't even see you come in. <laughs> so is the ability to pay for something, is that is discriminating on just one's ability to purchase whatever service it may be? Is that considered ethical or no? In a capitalist society, yeah, I think it's, a, it's that's acceptable, right? Especially in uh, an industry in which you know we're expected to pay. Now, there's a separate. This is back to this reification issue. There's a separate conversation to be had about whether how we are paid is it all fair, right? In the United States, in the world, right? For the services that we provide and for the work that we do. Uh, but that's again, we're we're looking at an AI problem that's re that's based in a larger social problem of wealth inequality, right? Um, but yes, I mean, I, I think when we talk about doing ethics in context, this is the kind of context that matters, right? And you, you know, you are offering something for purchase. Um, ability to pay is part of the expectation. Um, now, wouldn't it be great if everybody had a better ability to pay? Is a, is a social conversation we should have, uh, but it's probably, you don't have to fix it with your AI, right? Yeah. Um, on that question, I, um, sorry, maybe I'm going to mention a couple of jargons, right? Um, um, I guess people have learned about this uh, microeconomics, where you have this uh, consumer surplus, right? Which is the how you extract the amount of money based on their willingness to pay, right? Or uh, ability to pay. But then there is a slightly flip side, which is uh, I think is called the dead weight loss, which is people as an airline, it's still profitable to fly them, right? But uh, it's a pro the, pass uh, the passengers or consumers got priced out because the airlines set the price. So I guess if airlines can really uh, determine the ability to pay, so not only you get a consumer surplus, which is it help you to make a little bit more money, but that money could help you to also, same equally, help the people it used to be get priced out by these uh, airfares and so on, now have the ability to fly and fly more. So that, that could yeah. be make the society a bit fairer. Yeah, I also, uh, to, to follow up on that, I think the assumption that we know someone's ability to pay is actually could have problematic stuff built into it, right? So we don't have a perfect indicator of ability to pay. We have a bunch of other indicators, right? Um, and those indicators might have systematic biases in them and we should, we should, yeah, in a perfect world, if we knew, if they told us what they could pay, okay, we would know. But and even then we might not know, right? Like, so um, that is one of those problematic indicators or could be. So I think we should be careful about it. You know, know, knowing that we are working with 
an estimation. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm gonna try to frame this correctly. So this is a sort of new area and we recognize, right, that there is bias and the ethics around it. How do you balance that like with the, the, the politics of, it's not just domestic, it's global, right? And um, how does that fact, factor, how do, how do you, you know, address that? And because in, at times people are very aware that is unethical and it's, it's choice, you know. Um, any thoughts, any comments? That might be a two million dollar question, you're just saying, <laughs> <laughs> on politics. I think one of the hardest things about AI ethics is the fact that sometimes, maybe even frequently, it is doing politics by other means. Um, and, and nobody elected us, <laughs> right? And, and, and so this, it, we are doing decision making um, and putting procedures into place. And I mean, that's always been true to some degree, right? Within a legislative, you know, there's a, there's a structure, there's, and then we get to make decisions within that. But all of a sudden, the kinds of decisions that we can make with AI, they, you know, and this is moving out of this industry, but sentencing algorithms and all kinds of things are, are hugely political. Um, and we are, and the folks who are building them are saying, wait, <laughs> like, I don't want to make this decision about which is fair. Like, you, so definitions of fairness, there are a lot of definitions of fairness, and which one you ascribe to is going to depend on your politics. And that is itself very complicated. We don't know how to resolve it. We, as uh, if we think of AI development as an ind as a industry or a cross industry of various sorts, we need to have a conversation in that industry about the power that, of our decision making systems and the fact that there needs to be a more democratic way to, some, to, 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 to settle on some of these definitions. We don't, as a, as a world, we don't have um, structures to do that right now. Um, you know, the, is it the UN? No, I, I literally have no idea. <laughs> and so that's a huge, huge challenge coming down the road. You've spotted it. Anybody else? No? Actually, I didn't, I didn't notice Nicole came in there. Our corporate counsel came in, so uh, we did a disclaimer at the beginning. Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I did that. <laughs> so you talked about the time it's going to take to come up with best practices and how this technology is growing and widespread awareness of these problems is growing. Crystal ball, how long do you think it'll take? <laughs> mm. So best practices for sort of solving problems in particular contexts with stakeholder groups that make sense, two years. That's going to be quick, right? Like we're going to figure out how to consult, you know, in, in those, but those are the small problems, right? Um, and, but I think we'll have really good best practices. I think they're, they're actually happening now and there's watchdog groups and there's you know, things bringing up that are gonna form an ecosystem to help us do this. <clears throat> Problems like what counts as fair on a global level? The world is not trending that way right now. Um, I, like to a global discussion of fairness and like I, 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 it's a, I, I dream of that world. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I don't know, it's gonna be a long time. And so I think the best we can do for a, for a while is to cling to context as much as we can, right? Solve these AI problems for the context that we have, for the, for the um, user expectations that we know, for the, uh, you know, the uh, legal infrastructure that we're living under at that moment, uh, and just kind of adapt as we go. I want to come back to this discussion of this willingness to pay and the ability to, to pay, you know, uh, discussion, because that's very often at the heart of personalization, right? I think that's uh, uh, because I know you want this more. I mean, so I, I guess the thing is, how do you balance the two, right? Because uh, having the ability to pay doesn't mean I want to pay for this. I may not need to pay for this. I may have the ability to pay for upgrade tomorrow, flying out, you know, or midnight, going back to this SF my home, but I may not want to. Right? I mean, so so there's, you know, I, there need to be, a I would say, you know, some kind of balance, you know, on how do you determine what is the price that you want to offer to me as an individual, right? I think we know that, you know, certainly offering it to a large group is problematic. And we act, actually, I, I mentioned that yesterday, right? 
hyper personalization, in fact, actually is easier to some extent, right? It gets you a lot of the technical problem as well as the ethical problem, <laughs> you know, it's easier I and mean, we should go there, but somehow airlines are a little bit reluctant to go that, you know, hyper personalized because the type of data that they're dealing with, uh, but, um, but, you know, it does solve a lot of problems, but still, there is still, I would say this problem of, you know, what do you offer? I mean, say a, a price to me as an interview, how do you balance that? Uh, you know, if you have data, every data point you can get about me. Um, so you know my ability to pay, you know, but, and, and my willingness to pay, I don't, I, you know, you have my calendar, you see that tomorrow is actually free and everything. So, you know, you know, I'm not busy, I'm not in a hurry or whatever. Well, how do you come, how do you balance that? $3 million question. <laughs> True. Um, I mean, well, I, I, I guess uh, whether you're happy to pay or want to pay, quite often it's a in relative turn, right? So if you find that another airline is going to charge you $500 and here is try to extract the maximum to $450, you're probably still happy and pay the $450 instead of a $400 and so on. So I guess with this... Uh, NDC and then also keep an eye on what is other alternatives you have may actually be achieve a balance where you're happy to pay and then also airlines enjoy slightly higher revenue instead of, instead of selling at the originally say $400 and uh, and have not the, the inventory have not quite closed or whatever that alterns so I guess that's well AI if it can scan the environment quick enough yeah. So I will say, and we haven't had um, the data privacy conversation here today necessarily. And so that's another piece of this puzzle because data is at the heart of these systems. There are valid concerns about um, user expectations around, you know, right, whether they would have your calendar data and your, you know, because I mean, we know somebody has your calendar data. It's it's uh, Google probably, and then also anybody Google has shared that with, right? Which is uh, quite a few people um, potentially. Uh, so yeah, there's this question of you know where are we on sort of norms around data sharing and norms around data access and that sort of invasiveness of data access um, in order to do price discrimination and things like that. And I think that that's a super another super interesting conversation. I think it's a little bit removed from the AI fairness. Like fairness and privacy are sort of two separate issues within data ethics or information ethics. Um, so we could have that conversation, but <coughs> I think we probably we probably can't have it today. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. I really, really appreciate it, Tony, <laughs> Dr. Felton. Um, it has been a, a great conversation. Um, glad to have you guys here, and thank you. Those members of the audience that asked us questions, uh, I owe you 20 bucks. We're getting it started. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I believe everybody make sure we head back to the main room for one last uh, quick session before we all wrap up. Thank yep. you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys.